Practice exam three, part six. We're up to question 18, the theorem. Construct a proof for the following theorem. And you are presented with that formula, right? Now, what do you do when you're asked to prove a theorem? What is a theorem? A theorem is a formula proven with no premises, right? It's a formula which always begins with an assumption. If there are no premises to begin with, so you have to begin with some kind of assumption. Theorems are always tautologies. Remember from sentential logic. Um, the most important thing when asked to prove a theorem is to take the formula which is given on your page, question 18 there, right? And do what? Put that formula down the bottom of the proof. The bottom of the proof, right? So you draw a line. This is your, going to be your proof. It's going to start off here with one. Right? But this is going to be the last line. The formula you are given is the last line, the conclusion of the proof. The theorem is the conclusion of the proof. Right? Please do not put that formula up the top on the first line of a vertical line as if you are given it as a premise, because then what are you doing? That's the, this is the formula you are asked to prove. Right? If you're given it as a premise, then you're done. Right? But you're not done, and you won't get any points, and you will lose 22 points. Right? Because you won't have done anything what you need to... You need to prove this. Right? So how do you prove it? Okay, do the most important thing. Put the formula down the bottom, as I've done here. Right? This is the whole formula. It's big, it's long, it's ugly, it's horrible. Right? And I have no idea how to get going if I don't know how to um, go about these things. But what you have to do... Remain conclusion driven is the mantra for all proofs, right? If you've correctly put this formula down the bottom, as you should, because it is a theorem, then um, you just return to your mantra, as you do for all proofs, and you say to yourself, okay, what is the form of my conclusion? I let the form of my conclusion determine what move I should make to get it, okay? So what is the form of this big, long, ugly thing? You're actually helped out a lot by the square brackets in the formula, but this you should be able to identify as a conditional, right? right the, the major operator here is this one. You pair the brackets, that's what you'll discover. This is a conditional, which means the, uh, to prove it, you should use conditional proof, okay? Remember, a theorem is a formula proven with no premises, so you're going to make, you have to begin with an assumption. There's a question on the exam too. Um, Theorems always begin from certain assumptions, never from any premises. But since it's a conditional, the obvious assumption to make is the assumption for conditional proof. All right. So look, this is that's the most important step: is putting it down the bottom, recognizing this as a conditional, setting up for a conditional proof where you put the antecedent up the top and the consequent down the bottom. Right? You do that and you're, you've reduced, you've done the bulk of the problem. You've reduced it to um, any other kind of proof, right? I'm going to put my, so the antecedent is what? The form of the antecedent, you'll notice, is a conjunction. This whole thing here is the antecedent, right? It's for all x, fx, hook, not g, x, that, and... There exists an x, which is h, x, and not, not, g, x. So that's my antecedent, right? That's the antecedent of this conditional. I'll notice it's a conjunction. But what's crucial for conditional proofs? We just talked about it in the last part. Conditional proofs have the advantage over indirect proof. Uh, they have something similar to what you do with setting up for a universal generalization, as we just talked about in part five. Um, we put the consequent of the conditional we're trying to prove down the bottom, right? Oh, can we even see that? Sorry. <laughs> um, we put the consequent down the bottom, right? So here, I write this consequent down here, not for all x, hx hook fx, right? And now I really can move the screen up because that conclusion, you're not really worried about that anymore, right? Once I've derived this from this, right, then I just write 
conditional proof, steps one through whatever number this turns out to be, one through five or six or whatever it is, and then I'm done, right? So you don't need to worry about the conclusion anymore, really. You have to remember to come back and annotate it with the conditional proof and the numbers, as I just said. But otherwise, you've reduced the problem to just as if this is a premise and this is your conclusion, right? Perfectly analysis to a problem where you're given this is a premise and this is a conclusion. Okay? Okay, you will notice that your premise, right, your assumption, this formula you're now given to play with, right, because you're, what are we doing? We're in a conditional proof. We're assuming this. If this is, you know, we're trying to prove if that, then that. So we're given that, and we're showing that this follows, which entitles us to infer the conditional that is the Yattrell theorem. Okay, please take a moment to identify its form, right, is it a universal statement? Is it a condition? Is it a quantifier statement? No, it is not. It starts with the quantifier, but the scope of this quantifier only goes to here. You can, right, the scope of this initial quantifier goes only to here. This is in fact a conjunction. The major operator is a conjunction, right? Which tells me what rule I'm going to use on this formula. I cannot instantiate from this. Big mistake to think you can instantiate from one. You cannot. There's another quantifier over here. What you can do is Maybe I should remain conclusion driven and figure out something there first, but this is going to be okay. You should realize that is a conjunction, thus the rule, what do you do with conjunctions? You simplify, right? You, you're given this and that, you're allowed to derive both parts separately. So two and three are going to be for all x, fx, hook, not g, x, and Existent x, which is h x and not, not g x. Right? I've got it all right here. Yeah. F g h g f g h g. That's right. <sighs> okay. Um, simp. Why? This was assumption for CP. Simplification in one. Notice how crucial it is to be paying very close attention to the form of these formulas. It's been the thing we've been focused on throughout the whole course, really. The form of every formula is the clue, especially for proofs, to knowing where to go right, with these formulas. You've got to know that this is a conjunction. You cannot lazily think, oh, this looks to me like it's a uh, um, quantifier statement, this whole thing. It's not. And if you instantiate from it, you're wrong. Right? It is a condition. It is a conjunction, excuse me. And so you separate. And now you do have two formulas which are in quantifier form. These formulas you can instantiate and will instantiate from. Now the conclusion is not in quantifier form. Why not? It begins with a negation. If it begins with a negation, it cannot begin with a quantifier. If it doesn't begin with a quantifier, it's not in quantifier form. Beginning with a quantifier is the first of the two conditions being in quantifier form. Um, now you could say, well, this is a negation. I could set up for indirect proof. Indirect proof within this conditional proof, perfectly legal, perfectly appropriate way to go about uh, solving this problem, and you would be able to solve it that way. What would you assume? You'd assume, assume the universal statement for all x. If, if it's h, then it's f. All h's are f. You would assume that. Um, and you would derive a contradiction of some kind. 